Fix errors, waste, and issues in a couple of clicks. Get alerted whenever you're off track. Sign up at trueclicks.com. Wix Studio, the platform for agencies and enterprises to manage clients and projects with max efficiency. Sharing Wix's SEO tech to help you drive growth. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I like how the five-second countdown started and everyone just went quiet. It was quite ominous. Um, Thank you very much for joining us. I hope everyone's starting to feel a little bit better from last night. Uh, I do apologise for sounding a little bit like a, a, a Sean Dye, Sean Duff wish of a moment, but is isn't how correlated. But, um, so welcome to the AI panel. Uh, I believe it's the second or third panel of the day, and there's a few more after this. And I'm pleased to say that um, I'm going to be doing less talking because I've actually got some really intelligent people around AI across <laughs> me. So rather than me carrying on, um, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the topics. Irene? Uh, my name is Irene Rahman. I'm the Chief Data and Technology Officer at WaveMaker UK. And uh, my speciality has been in digital data and tech uh, for about 12 and a bit years. Too too long, as I would like to call it. Um, and yeah, really delighted to be invited to the panel. Hello, I am John Joe. I'm head of SEO at an agency called Box Chile. Um, we are primarily an SEO agency and I lead a team of uh, 11 account managers and content writers and technical people. And I did have to go onto our website about page to count them all up before I said that uh, today. Um, I'm not an expert on the how AI works, but I use AI every single day on my uh, clients and, um, and it's all about using it on our day-to-day -day clients, but also communicating to them uh, when people have, have a, like a negative reaction to AI, how we can get that across and sort of show them the positive side of it. So that's kind of where, I, that's why I'm up here today. Hello, I'm Mike. I work for an agency called Seven Dots. I'm the head of SEO. Uh, I've been doing SEO for 16 years now, which is just an alarming thing to say. Um, Coming up through kind of the technical SEO track. So a lot of what I'm interested in with AI is the, um, what's the bits that actually solve real world problems? What are the kind of components of technology that we can apply to create better experiences? No, cool. So uh, last but not least, I'm Dan Taylor. I'm a partner and head of technical SEO assault. Been in marketing now about 12 years, which yeah, now you actually start chancing to do that's scary. Um, my main interest in AI is technical applications, so like speed up auditing, um, how we can use it for process things, and elements like, and also just debugging co uh, complex issues on size of the indexing. But that's a technical topic, and first of all, we're going to start off on something a little bit more broad stream, and that's just around how we can use AI and how we are using AI, especially since ChatGPT burst on the scene about a year and a half ago, and we've got the other plethora of AI tools that spin up every week or so. And that's around generative content, John Joe. So yeah, like I say, um, I use uh, AI every single day for content, and I think that can be a positive thing. Um, I, I think people have negative reactions about AI because what we see the most of on places like YouTube and LinkedIn and things like that are the kind of SEO influencers and SEO bros who are doing these uh, entirely automated websites with completely generated content at scale. And we saw that they were having positive results to start with. The grass were going up. But then obviously last month, the March update happened and they've come very quickly back down to earth. And there's a lot of people looking at it and saying, told you so. Um, but I think we still can use these AI tools if we use them sensibly. We know that it's not against Google's guidelines. For example, in their um, uh, update on AI content, they say rewarding high quality content, however it is produced. So that's no answer in terms that it is not against Google's guidelines, but what people are ignoring is the high quality part. If you're just churning out and copying and pasting a chat GBC blog post, it's not going to be high quality. There's, you know, if it was, then absolutely go ahead and publish it with no edits. That's fine. It's not against Google's guidelines. Nobody can tell that it's AI. Um, apart from the fact that there are specific words and phrases and linguistic styles I'm sure you've all seen every single day um, that let's delve into and all that kind of like nonsense that it says over and over again. But apart from that, it is fine to use AI content. It is just you have to be a little bit smarter about it. And so what I'm trying to push with my teams is 
how to think outside the box. I'm not asking, I'm not putting a prompt in to say, write me a blog post on this and then expecting you to get a good answer. You're not going to get a good answer. Um, but what you can do is use the tools for part of your uh, content research and ideation process to come up with some specific ideas. Um, and uh, I don't want to spoil my talk uh, later, which is at 320, where I go into some detail on some of the specific workflows um, for that. Um, I think there's some interesting ones that people can take away. Um, but the general idea is that we're thinking slightly smarter about how we can use the tools. We can be creative with our prompting. We can understand the strengths of AI and the weaknesses and then use it for the strengths without just spamming content. Um, so yeah, and it's, uh, and I think I alluded to earlier, I, I speak to clients uh, every single day um, about, uh, about content and content ideas that we're producing for them. Um, and one of the big things that they always want to talk about right now is, oh, are you using ChatGPT for this? Are you just doing that? And I, I, do I need to still keep paying you? Um, and my answer is clearly yes, um, because <laughs> you, you, they, you can't, you have to have somebody who understands how to use the tools. It's using it as a tool. My, one of the phrases I do say in my talk um, and every day is I don't think of it as creating AI content. I think of it as using AI tools uh, in order to create excellent content. And it's a mindset thing. It's about understanding the way we're trying to use these tools. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what it is that I bring to the uh, panel and my views on AI generally. Um, and I'm finalizing I'll, I'll, conversation I'll, I'll, questions I'll add, about it. I'll add a little bit to it as well. And you're absolutely, absolutely right in saying that just AI content in itself is not enough. Um, the whole purpose and the the reason why AI has taken off as much as it has in these days, it's enhancing human ability, not replacing human ability. And I think it's something that we have to be very mindful because we've seen lots of examples of in um, legal industry and uh, in medical uh, sectors, people have used AI and not in the most uh, smartest way, even they're supposed to make you smarter. Sure. Um, whereas, you know, in some cases they've come up with um, a case um, uh, representation where the AI has quoted something that didn't actually exist, a hallucination in the outcomes. Um, to avoid that sort of um, mistakes, I think the recommendation from any AI expert is that it's not AI is a tool, it's a, like a tool, any other tool that you'd use. You'll not just use one thing, you'll use your own expertise um, to almost edit the content. So if you think of it this way, they instead of writing from scratch or doing a very manual way of like a keyword and rich, uh, you know, content right, um, you can now actually start from a place of, oh, it's 50% done, I just need to edit it to a point where it's a very good quality content. Because as you say, Google really doesn't care who writes the content, it cares about the quality of the content. Um, so if be keeping that in mind and incorporating AI in a more useful way in our workflow and you know mindful way in our work workflow is always a recommendation that we put forward. So kind of just to build on where you say, obviously Google doesn't care who writes the content. Their actual official stance on this, which they published in April uh, 2023, so this is literally pre-SG era notices, is literally AI and automation can be useful tool to create helpful content with AI is used for primary purpose of manipulating search rankings that's a violation of our long-standing policy against spammy automatically generated content so then in relation to obviously we saw ChatGPT, we saw the big graphs going up and then in the updates towards the end of last year we saw them crashing down and we've seen that again in kind of March if it isn't the AI content side better why have sites who've used AI and led on being penalized or I say penalised, why have they been impacted in such a way in terms of traffic and rankings? Yeah. I think, um, so when AI came out, let's be honest, I think any SEO of a certain age probably remembers like the days when um, kind of one way to go traffic, I think like the eHow model, when you just paid writers dirt cheap to spew rubbish out into the ether um, and then monetized it on the back end. Um, I think what happened was a lot of SEOs when ChatGPT came out, were like, hey, that model suddenly works again. Because what sort of happened was the amount you made per article got less than the time it, or the, the cost of that writer. 
And suddenly with chat GPT, that cost becomes negligible and people are just like, aha, I can do this again. And suddenly just waves of shit sort of sprayed everywhere. Um, I think this, uh, this isn't a new problem, right? It's just the economics sort of made it go away for a little bit and now it's coming back. And I think that's what Google's kind of touching on is um, so long as you're creating a genuinely good experience, cool, it doesn't, they don't care about the tools, but that kind of, I'm just going to pick up a keyword and churn out stuff that's already out there and just reproduce it and then get some spammy links and try and make a couple of quid. That's the thing that they're trying to um, clamp down on. So if you're in a business model that looks like that, that's where I think curing Google's um, sites are a little bit. That's the thing. Noth nothing has changed, really. Their language there when they're saying uh, about using AI to manipulate the search results, that's always been the case. Creating just spammy, programmatic content is absolutely it, it's, it's against their guidelines, and it always will be. It always has been. Um, programmatic is fine if you're creating quality content, but programmatic is uh, an issue if you're just churning out stuff for the sake of manipulating results and ranking. Um, and I think it's difficult as an SEO because clearly everything that we're doing is to manipulate the search results and to try and get a, a keyword ranking. We know this, but when we're having our conversations with clients um, and uh, it's a mindset thing, it's about thinking, does this add value? If you could honestly say, yes, it does, then no issue. It's fine. Publish that content. Um, if it doesn't, then maybe get it to a point where it does before you go ahead and publish it. It's nothing has changed. It's just that we now have this tool that can speed us up. Um, one of the uh, key things that you said is um, it's alluding to it being a jumping off point. You start and you have some kind of content. You don't, you're not staring at a blank page. And um, because, because you need to have a human element and you still need to get stuck in and you can't just copy and paste it. A lot of people um, have sort of said things along the lines of, well, what's the point? Is it not faster just to write it? We're like, you know, um, I am strongly of the opinion that using ChatGPT um, and other AI tools can speed you up and can give you better ideas and can uh, and you end up with a better end result faster. So we can do things that was not at scale um, in a spammy way, but at scale, you know, do things just faster for our guys and give them more value. I think one of the things that we say at work and quite a few people as well that think of uh, generative AI as a really eager intern. <laughs> they really want to help you. Um, they're just not there yet. Um, but it's it's something that we have in the process of um, editing is always going to be easier than, as you say, process of creating from a uh, blank space. Um, but also bear in mind that a lot of the, I would say, misuse of AI, you know, the tool enables you to create uh, content at a mass. Um, and one of the things that we see Google, as you say, they, you know, they're really... Um, honing in on um, curbing that, that, you know, the search results shouldn't become just a place of trash. Um, and they are doing a lot in that space and they're using AI to actually curb that. So it's goes full cycle. AI is creating the problem, but they're also using AI to solve the problem. So it's, it's something that I find it really interesting in the sense that, you know, it's not about the oh, AI is good or AI is bad. It's just who is wielding it is deciding whether it's used for good or bad. I think one of the other key things, you know, which you, everyone's got to touch on this, is how necessarily, because Google's always had these policies against spammy content. I mean, for me, when Panda first came out, that was to combat everybody using Unique Article Wizard. Apologies for anyone who could remember using Unique Article Wizard, because that was awful, truly. Um, Definitely wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> or, or me too much but essentially we've always had that kind of thing it's always changed is the dynamics and because the internet is now so much bigger the level of content production just in terms of new urls i think it was seo day two years ago uh gary Ilyash, uh came out with a statement that 60 percent of the internet was duplicate from a just a technical perspective of how bad the internet is built and it's expanding at a far greater rate so i think over the last year we've inadvertently started to understand more about how Google handles quality thresholds and how it actually analyzes it. So with all the new AI sites that kind of sprung up, saw the big graphs, we saw the, the big SEO heist, which I'm sure everyone saw over Twitter and Mastodon and whatnot, just crash and burn. Part of that was also freshness, because we know, for example, if we submit a URL through Search Console, we give a freshness boost. And that can take a URL over the quality threshold for indexing, freshness decays with time, drops back below. And I think that's why we've also seen on larger sites, 
more URLs going into discovered, not currently indexed, crawled, not currently indexed, because it's fingerprinting at subfolder levels, because at the end of the day, Google has, Google is not our friend. Google is a profit making business and he has to store data and crawl data. And if he can go, oh, there's 10,000 pages on this subfolder and I've looked at the first thousand and rural rubbish, I ain't putting 9,000 extra resources into processing it. And I think that's our levels of how we understand indexing and how it's not necessarily AI's fault, it's just our, or some assumptions of right to be indexed or right to be crawled and right to have that kind of capacity. So that's going to be more interesting, I think, as we go over time. Before we move on to the next topic, does anyone else have anything they want to add um, around confidence? I think just the, so there's a, this, I think it's a Bill Gates quote where um, he says, like, people overestimate what technology is going to do in two years and underestimate what it's going to do in 10. I think right now, a lot of the conversation around content with AI is about looking at kind of the workflow that we've all done for years and years and years and saying, okay, how can I apply this to make it more efficient? But actually, when you've got with AI, there's the possibility there to create content in whole new ways, like not kind of, I'm going to write a blog, but like what, I think that's the really interesting long-term question is kind of what can we create that we just couldn't create before? And can we do that? And can we create things that are going to be really great experiences for kind of customers and users? Um, and using AI at bay to kind of scale things or kind of develop content in unique ways, meet, kind of learn things about them, meet them where they are. Um, that's, that's the stuff that I think is going to really kind of work over the long term versus I'm just going to take kind of my production pipeline for a blog post and make the middle bit of it an AI instead of using a copywriter. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because one of the key things with AI right now is I'm able to do things that I simply wasn't able to do before. Um, so for, you'll see in my talk later, there's a, um, a Chrome extension that I built, which um, our team uses for uh, keyword research. And it looks at people also ask questions. I don't know how it works. It's, it does work and it, we find it really useful. I don't know how I built it, but it, it is there and it works now and we use it every day. Um, that kind of thing, I didn't have access to that before. If I wanted to create something like that before, I'd have to either pay for a tool or pay for a developer to create that tool. Mm we now have access to some of these things and we can be creative in how we, we manipulate the AI to build things that are useful to us. This actually kind of nicely segues into the next topic. I don't know if that's intentional or not, um, but yeah. moving away from generative content and spamming the internet with blogs, mm -hmm. how we can actually use AI to for process development, for chunking large tasks, making them easier, and also how we can use it for better data analysis and better business information and stakeholder informing. Um, Irene. Thank you. Um, that's what I do every day. Uh, essentially, I don't do anything. I just basically type it somewhere. Some, something does it for me. As you say, I don't know how, yeah. but it happens. Um, actually, I do know how I used to actually do um, large language model development myself, but you know, I'm not, I'm not in the guts of it anymore. Um, but um, we are using, um, various different AI solutions. So moving away from, as you say, generative AI. Generative AI is quite new. Um, everybody from out of the bush have just come out and gone like, I am a, I'm an expert in AI because I can write a prompt. Whereas people who have been, so for example, myself who worked in developing large language model to this day, I know all the things I don't know. So I very much stay away from calling expertise on that, but the little that we know and the tip of the iceberg that we are touching right now and utilizing on our process automation, it's significantly improved our ability to do tasks that tasks that we've done previously, but faster. So uh, efficiency gains, but also things that we've never done before. So creative outputs that we never would have imagined uh, doing, um, not just the you know, removal of requirement for experts for development purposes, because I can actually do plain text commands and get Python code re written for me, um, which I don't even, you know, I can even create an agent, agent GPT with plain text who will then review said uh, code so that I don't have to do anything. Uh, I just have to describe my output better. So all of that is available to us and how we utilize it in an agency world, it's a little bit more utilization in the sense that we we look at the RPA side of things, so robotic process automation, which is 
uh, become much more prominent, but also workflow automation side of things. So our SEO team, um, Richard, who will be speaking, uh, actually speaking right now as we speak, um, is on a stage talking about how they're using it. And um, essentially it has helped the teams think of a lot more options a lot quicker and also remove a lot of the manual tasks that they would have had to do um, to say, for example, find best keywords or find best contextual content and things like that. We're also not just sitting around um, for one, you know, siloed approach of like, okay, just for data. It's the avail availability of various different AI solutions and integration into various different platforms means that they're all interconnected and it overlaps in a very big way in the sense that now our SEO team works very closely with all our other digital teams or even out of home teams because all the information helps understand who are the people you are communicating to um, and it gives us a very good 360 view. Um, one of the projects I recently worked on, which was I think it was very good in the sense that it's um, it's called an audience brain and essentially what it does is things like a the algorithm thinks like a human being just for the topic of understanding people's behavior if that makes sense so what that allows our teams various different teams so obviously that's a very good benefit for segmentation but it also creates really targeted content and advises the teams on very targeted content uh, and very targeted brand content which it would have taken our team i don't know several weeks to come to you know if it was just human being working on it having said that of course human beings are involved in um the last uh pass because it's not just the algorithm is just pushing it out and we're not checking anything we add uh, about 25 to 50 percent um, edit on what the outcome comes in, but it's still fantastic. I can I can get an output out in four days instead of four weeks. So I, I know I know everyone else is other things. Private question just off back about so when you're doing twenty five to fifty percent edit on the output, yeah, how are you accommodating for potential confirmation bias or biases from the editors going into that? Well, it's we try to here again we rely on technology funny enough um and um there are uh custom uh solutions that we have built knowing some of the biases that we hold so for example um algorithms as you know and i'm sure some of you have uh, read as well in some of the popular algorithms are producing a lot more right-wing content than um you know uh, more balanced content we have uh, custom rules in place to almost pick out on some of the known biases. It doesn't, it's not a 100% solution, of course it's not. Um, biases are ingrained within human beings as well, so why wouldn't the machine, the machine has learned from the people, so it will have built-in uh, biases as well. But we try our best to make sure that there is strong governance in place and using technology to govern some of those outputs as well. Um, but I think it's a really important thing that you raise that how do we actually um, address those biases? But not all biases are, I would say, you know, negative in the sense that we, as you know, that we work with various different brands and they have a, almost in the brief, they in, encourage you to like, oh, make sure that our message is ingrained in what comes out. Um, the only people I would say that the most non-biased content that we've created um, is uh, government. Funny enough. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's 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 something that is a challenge, but it's much better than how it used to be before. Before it used to be just my opinion, but now it's uh, it's a very much federated way of uh, getting the content out. It's now a, a data-driven opinion. Uh, I, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> so talking about processes, um, this is the part of AI that excites me the most because I think just looking, I know I'm talking about content and a lot of my expertise is, is on using it for content, but I really think that's just the tip of the iceberg for what it can actually be used for. And I'm thinking specifically in an agency situation, um, but also in-house. Um, the, the biggest and most valuable insights that I've got from using AI tools have been building workflows um, to analyze uh, individual pieces of content and also sites. So uh, there's a workflow that I'll be sharing later where 
um, you ask it to have a look at the sitemap uh, for your um, for your content, your post sitemap, um, and then group the content into content clusters, which is a task that would have to have been done manually before. Um, and then look at the individual articles within those clusters and then later to suggest uh, gaps that you might have. Um, so that informs your content ideation strategy. Um, it's a task that used to be completely manual. And so you'd have to look at it and analyze it and spend a lot of time. Um, and when some of our clients have X amount of hours that they pay us for, I don't want to be wasting so much time on the research phase. Um, when actually we could be spending that time adding value and giving them something that's going to grow the graphs and um, and they're going to keep coming back. Um, and so there's, I think, thinking smartly about the, the the things that we're doing now that are our pain points and are taking a long time are the things that we need to be looking at. How can we build AI workflows for these? Um, and there's a there's a few more that I won't go into now, but I'll be sharing later. And um, that, that's the most powerful thing for, for AI for me. So on, and just moving to something slightly different, so obviously your talk was yesterday, which I was in the same session, which will be available on the vault that Brian has. Your process automation and thought on how we can use AI is a little bit out there, I guess. Yeah, so we're, we've got a lot of internal R&D at the moment that's um, some of it's on sort of very similar things to you guys just said around um, kind of what's the grunt worky parts of workflow and how do we automate that? So like we're using AI to, um, or some, not really AI, but we're using um, embedding vector data. So some of the, like the technology, mm -hmm. uh, some of the technology around AI to kind of automate things like redirection mapping. Um, and we've had a lot of success with that. It's got massively sped up that workflow. Um, I think the other things we're picking up on actually, and this is particularly looking, when I look at some of the juniors and kind of how they're working, we're trying to figure out ways to kind of amplify this is, um, Computers are actually hard to use, right? Um, like I've managed to get a 16 year career out of knowing how to do a VLOOKUP. <laughs> and they keep paying, it's brilliant. Um, and actually what's, um, when, you, when you kind of look at what uh, somebody in their first, second year doesn't know how to do that, do, and they count a problem that uh, I'd immediately go, okay, I need to take this spreadsheet, this spreadsheet, VLOOKUP them together, do this formula. They're just going to chat GPT and being like, hey, get this result. And then what we're trying to do is kind of keep an eye on what they're doing and say, oh, okay, is there a tool in that? Can we um, use that to kind of get more productivity out of um, kind of more junior people? And I think in a weird way, that's sort of, maybe in some ways, that glimpse of the future of computing is that like moving away from that idea of I need to know the specific incantations to kind of make the thing that I want to, the computer to do happen and just say, I need you to combine this data and do this. And it doesn't really matter if you click the right buttons in the right order. That's going to be a massive productivity unlock. And I think just looking at how juniors are working, um, they're already kind of just instinctively doing that. And that's something I think we're kind of very interested in, um, kind of how do we amplify. Um, also, there's that idea that you can bounce ideas off a computer. Like, that's weird. Like, you thought about that like a year ago. That would have freaked me out. But like watching the designers, and they're just like throwing ideas into a computer and just seeing how they look. And probably not the final piece, but just to kind of like do a workflow in their mind and kind of get thoughts out of their, their head into a physical space. Like, again, how do you amplify that? That's, that, that's a lot of what we're, we're looking at as well. Um, just to bring it to a little bit more at a personal level. So these, all the process automations are great. So a TMI, um, I'm a neurodiverse individual. So I've always struggled with long form content. So I genuinely just lose concentration when I'm reading through 96 pages of brief. Um, and then I, was like, oh, I don't remember what I said. So I, normally I would have had to read it at least 10, 15 times to almost like what was the last sentence I read, I've forgotten. So um, that has always been a you know issue for me in school, in, you know, in my education, in my previous workplaces and something that I've always had to manage myself. Whereas a lot of the tools, things which are built into the browsers and things which are just on the fingertips uh, these days, I can just upload a document and it can generalize the top five um, important points of that document. I don't have to uh, worry about have I missed something really critical or even annotations or um, meetings which are noted for you. So I, I am that person who cannot do the talking and the writing and the next thing what I'm going to say thinking. That's not me. Uh, whether I'm presenting, 
whether I'm listening, whether I am, you know, taking notes. <laughs> I can't do them all at the same time. So all of those little things that, you know, doesn't get that much PR, like things that OpenAI is doing all the time. Um, those are life changing for an individual like myself. And I see a lot of people in my workforce as well on a day to day, you know, spell check is not the, you know, Grammarly is not the be all and end all of the problems that it solves, but uh, it's just uh, better writing, better communication and helping people who, you know, suffer from invisible challenges. I think AI has been really, really helpful. So, you know, if nothing, that in itself is worth it for me. No, thank you for sharing, Ari. I think it's, it's yeah, there's a lot of things which Chad GP's in, even what Google's shown with SGE, with SGE whilst you're browsing, which I don't know if everyone's seen, as well as the wonderful whatever's going to happen on the SERP. So you can have the option in the sidebar to have SGE on the fly summarise the page you're on and also pull out the questions, answers, and the whole link and all the rest of that. So that's it's these accessibility things as well, which is being applied to, but it isn't as... I don't know, he doesn't get the same apocalyptic drama as I guess what most of these in the SEO world. So we don't give it the front page on Barry Schwartz's website. Um, so with how that is all going, I think it's also worth us just touching on, as well as like we've spoken about using things in agency, how we can use things for data analysis, how we actually make sure we're in line. So that's like how we use AI ethically and in line with policies within agency world and also in-house. So I think that's worth touching on. In especially content production as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, this is something that we've thought about. Um, uh, I think it goes back to me. Uh, it's, it's that whole mindset of creating excellent content rather than creating AI content. And we're using AI tools to help us do that. And I think as long as we have that mindset and that's the, the direction we're going, I think we're kind of okay. Um, the, I think... So congratulations to everyone in this room because you've officially made it over 12 months and ChatGPT hasn't stolen your job. And it's, I, I think it's not going to because we still need people like me and you to manipulate these tools. They've just become part of our workflow. Um, and I, I just think that's a positive thing. Um, there are a, a huge amount of workflow. So um, looking specifically at content again um, and how it can analyze um, documents and give ideas. Um, one of the key things that we do is um, read this article and think about questions that somebody might still have after having re read it. And so it will give you these ideas and you can understand what you either don't cover in that article and maybe that becomes another article with internal links or it becomes FAQ questions and things like that. Um, there's a huge amount of extra value that we can get by using these tools. It understands, it doesn't understand um, what it's talking about, but it does a very good impression that it is. And the ideas that it gives you can be manipulated by a human, always by a human, um, to make our content better. I think that's a, a positive thing. Um, my plan is to start bringing that robot dog with the flamethrower into pitch meetings as a really subtle, you should really sign this contract. I don't know if where that stands on, um, on ethics. Um, I, I can't remember K9 being that violent, but okay. Um, <laughs> so I just wildly misunderstand dog Um yeah. I think with the, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know with you, I'm not worried about um, AIs coming to take all our jobs. Because I think even just on a, this is less the history of technology, right? Yes, you get somebody makes something more efficient, but then companies grow and then they want to continue growing. And so that new level of efficiency just becomes the baseline. Um, so yes, and in, individuals will be doing more, but then the, We'll be getting more success and companies will want to grow, which will create more jobs and the kind of cycle continues. So there may be a little bit of a dip there um, when you look through kind of previous technological disruptions. There's usually a little bit of a kind of readjustment, but I don't think it's kind of we're all going to be kind of bowing to our robot masters anytime soon, unfortunately, which I really want to. I don't want a pressure of work anymore. Uh, shit, but, but the um, I think that and that felt that human filter element is kind of the most critical thing. I mean, yeah, we, we, we've all seen some of the strange hallucinations that um, AI can make. So just kind of, there's always going to be that role. I hope there's always going to be that role to be that filter. Um, we're going to live in a very interesting future if there's not. I'm just looking at the time, but I will take a little longer to answer this one because I'm, I'm very fortunate I get to sit on the government, UK government uh, AI task force and the EU task force as well. So I get to influence the policies that comes out and I can tell you from my point of view they are not enough to actually curb some of the challenges that comes from ethically from privacy point of view of um, the AI side. Um, 
just to take you back, uh, if anybody remembers uh, 1996, there's no such thing as Google. We couldn't Google things. We couldn't Google Map. We couldn't. That term was just something uh, mathematical. Um, so things change. And when first Google uh, search came into play, there was lots of, you know, uh, misnomer about, oh, it's not going to work. Oh, God, they're, they are set, you know, looking through all our stuff and then you can find online and it's not going to be great. Or there was the whole other camp of like, this is going to change the world. Let's all buy stocks and share on Google. Um, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> uh, missed out. Uh, but um, it's just a example of how new technology or... Um, the appearance of um, evolution of technology and how quickly it can become part of our DNA. And yes, every single time we see something new appear, which is a new platform or a new method of operating in society, whether it's these days when you see kids with, when I say kids, that just shows my age, um, TikTok, and they're actually learning their lessons in TikTok size, um, bite size videos. Uh, and that's their normal uh, way of understanding and learning and consuming uh, information. Um, and it's the same with uh, the emergence of AI in its current state. Because if you all remember, and people in the know, it's um, not all remember, not everybody was there in 1950. But the, ter the term uh, artificial intelligence was coined around 1950. So it's it's been there in the research and the background for a long time. And machine learning is subset of said uh, artificial intelligence. So machine learning has been here for a long time. Um, and we have learned from all of this and we have already taken a lot of major step in ensuring that the biases that we have when it comes to, you know, me being a person of color, uh, that's something that I'm acutely aware of in some of the algorithm data training that we experience, I personally experienced myself. So there is a lot of work to be done, but I am quite hopeful that this is not going to be Skynet future with uh, AI. It's very much going to be a Star Trek future with AI in the sense that it will allow us to free ourselves from the mundane and actually do things what human brains are made to do and ins inspirational work and think outside the box the algorithm still can't do that i say that knowing that no one has announced uh uh gen oh, the general artificial intelligence yet so uh, <laughs> unless somebody announced it right now I'll, I'll you know in a year's time i'll take that back um but i think from an ethics point of view i think it's very important to understand how we train our models and what sort of information uh, we're putting in our models because this is the thing with the current algorithm is that it will do what you teach it on um, so the emphasis and the responsibility lies with every single one of us in the sense that we are the users of the tools and the tech that's available to the world and how we choose to apply it and how we choose to um, implement it in our work in the you know in the world in the world especially in media because you know we we are very much aware that what we're showing to our children or who we are targeting so it's it's the responsibility lies with all of us technology will always remain the technology it's it's you know it's, it's not a great idea to blame the computer for uh destroying my toast <laughs> it did do that <laughs> there's, um, there's a little acronym in developer speak, which I stumbled across by accident and then worked out what it meant. And it was usually people, uh, developers putting me some tickets I was raising, and they were calling it picnic errors. Sure. Uh, picnic is problem in chair, not in computer, yep. which was a fun one to learn. But no, 1996 was a much simpler time. We weren't able to Google it, but we could ask Jeeves. Okay, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, sorry if I've just made everybody else feel old and everybody else, and they're going, what's Jeeves? The exit is that way. Um, mm -hmm. So the final bit we want to kind of go over before we open up the floor to questions is kind of more looking forward. So we're going into actual pure team full hat and speculation territory here. Um, I want to start this off with about 13 hours ago, uh, Alphabet released their 2024 Q1 earnings report. And as always, uh, Sundar Pichai has a lovely sentence in it to 
reassure shareholders that money is going to grow on trees and come their way. Um, so those who haven't read it yet, the uh, latest is that our results in the first quarter reflect strong performance from search, YouTube and cloud. We are well underway with our Gemini era and there's great momentum across the company. That's a real shareholder pleasing sentence, but isn't it? Great momentum. Um, our leadership in AI research and infrastructure and our global product footprint position us well for the next wave of AI innovation. And I know at the moment, in fact, with people in the industry, myself included, we're speculating that SGE poetically might be released next month in May IEO, since it's a year to release, and that shows the niceness there. But kind of going to open it up now as about speculation of where do we actually see AI going over the next few months? And I mean, I mean, I don't think we have to worry for our jobs, but how do we, what, what can we expect from Google, Bing? Yes, Bing exists. Um, and everyone else in the AI sphere. So one thing uh, that I strongly predict will happen is that um, one of the key trust signals in the next few years is going to be uh, human generated or human created guarantee. And particularly uh, on things like um, like art, so novels, for example. Um, so right now with using tools like ChatGPT and others, it's not possible to create a coherent novel using ChatGPT entirely AI generated. But it is possible to um, do a kind of rough estimation of that and get it launched on the Amazon um, uh, storefront because I've done it and I've got a book on there right now which I've not read a single word of. Um, I, it makes it will make no sense at all. Uh, but it is entirely AI generated. I did this to um, to test. They've got because um, all these platforms are scrambling um, to um, to implement the guarantees against um, AI content on their platforms. Um, so Amazon's one is that they ask you now to say um, and declare whether AI was used when you created content. You just lie, just take no, and, uh, <laughs> and it gets uploaded and it's there and available for, for people to, to buy and um, nobody has it, I don't want anybody to. Uh, it's just, just kind of a proof of concept. Um, but the key thing is that it's going to get easier and easier. Right now, maybe we struggle to get a thousand words out of chat GPC, maybe in a year's time when we get GPT five and six, et cetera, et cetera, we can produce 200,000 words, which is a novel. And maybe that's coherent and maybe it makes sense. You know, the very next day that that technical technology is available, people are going to flood the Amazon store and our platforms are going to have to catch up and create some kind of guarantee against this. And so, yeah, I, I see us walking through Waterstones and books having stickers saying 100% human guarantee, things like that. I think that will happen. Just building on that, it's interesting because yesterday, in your talk, again, it's available in the vault for anyone after this who haven't seen it. You spoke about the, the token limits and how they're expanding across things. And that kind of ties in with what John Joe just said around how we can potentially see that wave of novellas coming about in the coming months. Oh, there's a, there's a wave of crap books. <laughs> <laughs> Kindle's going to be fun. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think that's just a, that's a hardware limitation at the moment. It's just that that's something that um, we can kind of look at the tech roadmaps with kind of things like TPUs. Uh, they've already got plans to kind of gradually raise that ceiling. Um, so the, 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 like I said, the ability to do long form documentation. I mean, I think Gemini 1.5 is already up to a million token limit, I think it is. Um, and that's the point where you can just be like, here's my entire code base, fix the bugs. Mm. Um, and it's, it's got a big enough contact window to do that. Right now, if you could coding, it's like hit, like five lines of code and maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. Um, and see, I think, I, think, I think that context window problem does, it does go away in, in pretty short order. Just, just for everyone's benefit, in the audience who wasn't in your talk yesterday who doesn't understand token limits. So yesterday, I know you mentioned, so that, I mean, everyone saw six, eight months ago, we had that big wave of people gloating around on Twitter, LinkedIn, X, Blue Sky, Mastodon, whatever else came about, about how they were using AI. What was the what was the token limit around like ChatGPT three Turbo? I think it was it was sixteen thousand tokens, which roughly works out to about two thousand words. That's why if you have like long conversations with GPT and it starts forgetting something that you said several minutes ago, it's because it's kind of passed out of that token limit and, and it, as far as it knows, it no, that part of the conversation no longer exists. So we've got to look forward, but we've gone from about a 2,000 word limit on 16,000 tokens to a million tokens on Gemini. Yeah. And that, that's the point where you start getting into, like, rewrite this book, because now you've got enough letters for it to kind of process the entire book and, and not forget, like, the first five chapters. 
Oh, Kindle's going to be fun for the next few months. <laughs> um, <laughs> Irene, what are your thoughts? Um, I have two predictions. They're not mine. I'm clearly stealing them from someone else. Um, they're a bit technical uh, in the sense that the processing power of uh, large language models will inevitably go up, but go up to a very ridiculously high. There you go. They're, they're obviously getting it. Um, but uh, very high um, speed because IBM recently announced that they are exploring qubits and uh, biological uh, data storage processes, which is essentially using DNA to store data. So data processing speed will go up plus the storage space the thing that limits essentially what you're saying. The thing, the hardware limitations are being explored to actually now go, okay, it's infinitely more resourceful to use biological slash quantum processing, which is great. So that's going to give boost to the ability to not just read books, you know, um, my whole library. Can I just have that uploaded and I never need to look at a library ever again? Essentially a massive audible, isn't it? <laughs> um, and the second prediction is rags. And no, no, I'm not talking about the tattery little clothes. Um, it's large language models that are expensive and time consuming to train on individual organization or individual topics. Uh, so smaller models are being explored and Google is actually at the forefront of it. Uh, so is IBM. Uh, and so is Microsoft. Um, but essentially what that means is that it will be much quicker and cost effective to train on the model on your brand or just on particular uh, account, for example, uh, as we an agency work on. And not just content, but creative processes, planning, and the and it's faster. So that's something that also has been announced by various different organizations and they're making it available for mere mortals like us to actually try and build it ourselves. I'm going to spam the internet with. So with the kind of final thing, what is everyone's thoughts on SGE? Because I kind of feel we can't have an AI panel out mentioning an SGE or at least in part be the seemingly secondary conveyor belt of AI products coming out, so like virtual try-on, um, the weird kind of t-shirt Tinder thing where we introduced for fashion as well, um, and also the generative images for fake product shopping. What's everyone's thoughts on how that's going down? Like, do you think SG will come out in a month's time? Do you think SG will be phased? Do you think it'll be part of premium? Like, like what's the conspiracy theories? You go first. Sure, um, so uh, yeah, I think phased approach for sure. Um, I think one thing as SEOs um, working on specifically on client accounts is that we need to understand how to track some of the searches and some of the uh, the data because we're going to have to um, acknowledge that we're going to be living in more and more in a world of the no click search um, answers sometimes perfectly appropriately will be answered within the SERP and um, and that's fine. Um, and so certain types of searches that we maybe traditionally would have created a piece of content around isn't going to be as relevant anymore um, in, in quite the same way. Um, maybe we still want to create that content because we want to be the, the you know, in, in similar ways to feature snippets, we want to be chosen to be the provider of that information. But if people aren't clicking on it, then they're not seeing our call to actions and things like that. Um, so how do we track that we've created this piece of content, they've found their answer, um, and later on they buy, how do we prove that value to our clients? That's gonna be the challenge for me. Um, so, um, yeah, I do see it as it it will be a challenge. I think go. it's um, search results that don't have ad at all. Um, I think it's going to be a space that you're going to see SGE primarily on. So G Google sells like that's effectively 80% of their business. I don't think they're going to stop linking to, to things. But one of the, I think it's, it's Apple's fault, right? So the Apple rolls out kind of anti-tracking um, kind of um, tracking transparency, um, the value of banner ads falls, the publishing space, the informational kind of publishing space, um, it's, it stopped making money, so it's kind of forced a race to the bottom, which is why every website has kind of become basically unreadable now. Um, if you're Google, that's a real threat, because what then happens is something like GPT comes in, like OpenAI, and it's like, well, this is a better way of getting 
kind of answering information now than something where the information like bouncing around and banner ads are getting in your way and you can't read it. Um, and then if you're like thinking marketplace, what's, how does somebody disrupt Google? Well, GPT starts that and then they start working their way down to kind of more commercial products. That's a way Google gets disrupted. So I think SGE, at the, at the kind of pointy end of the funnel, it doesn't make any sense for them to, to roll out and kind of transact. And like generative AI for like transactional searches is a bit of a rubbish experience anyway. But in that kind of publishing space, um, open AI is a real threat. And then if you want to kind of protect your um, near monopoly, if you're Google, you need to squash that threat. And I think that's what SGE is about. Even if the business model of SGE itself doesn't make a lot of sense in isolation. Uh, SGE will be available. I mean, that's just, you know, going to happen in one form or another. Very much in your camp in the sense that Google is not going to take a cannon to their business model and go, ha, ha, yeah, sure. <laughs> Why not? It will help everybody because, you know, Google has been known to be helping humankind. Um, but uh, it's just one of those things that, of course, it will happen. Um, but as many of us remember when um, the whole cookie apocalypse situation was, you know, all, all was all the jazz, um, it's... It's just one of those things. It's just working differently um, instead of in the cookie situation or the uh, when the PIR, the IDs were removed, we started looking at cohort-based uh, targeting. Um, here we'll have to see more contextual and more quality-based content creation so that the content gets picked up. So it's just a different form of optimization versus the traditional form of optimization. So I'm not concerned of the future when SG is available. I am more um, aware that there will be a change and we'll have to adapt. And, you know, humans are very good at doing that. <laughs> I very much fall inside the same camp as yourself. I think it's going to be a phased approach. I think we'll, and it may also be a free and a premium approach because we have obviously Google flirting the idea of putting, obviously, well, they charge for certain Gemini features and they charge for other products. In industries where Google has high level of confident data anyway. So e-commerce, we're feeding it all our structured data from product feeds. Uh, anything that has a local element to it, we're basically feeding it Google business profile data, local data. Travel, it went around 10 years ago, buying loads of data off travel companies and it has its own travel guide stuff. Those industries where it's relatively low bandwidth, I mean, if you went to do a, a two day itinerary in Berlin, it can pull the data accurately from Google business profiles because it's got that cached. It can understand how many hours, it can understand reviews, it's got that sentiment already boxed up. It can understand what's different, so that will reduce hallucination. And then, like, similarly with Ecom, it's already doing it in the US with the filters on the side. It's got a high level of confidence. Where I think you'll start charging is potentially for people like us who go out of way and search for, I don't know, compare Beyonce's Jolene versus Dolly Parton's Jolene. That's a very off the flag thing. It's going to require bandwidth to do it. And they're like, do you know what? You can pay us a subscription to do that because that is a wasting thing just to make us look stupid. So on my kind of note, we've got um, about, this is my maths going to work out here, Ruth. I think about 15 minutes for questions. Seven minutes. Okay, great. So very whistle stop. <laughs> I, uh -huh. It's a good job that maths is not a part of technical SEO whatsoever. Um, so yeah, Ruth has a microphone. If anyone has any questions for anybody, please raise your hand. Hi. Um, it was just a question in regards to AI content, really. Obviously, there's a lot of AI detection tools out at the moment with varying levels of accuracy. Um, if you have a piece of content that is human written, you know, and potentially like a case study or a PR, and so there's a lot of in-depth information on there, it is good quality, but it's flagging consistently as very high AI. Is it still worth uploading? Is it going to get flagged by Google? You know, it, should you amend it so that it isn't? I don't, so yeah. so uh, my perspective on this is most of those tools are pretty much junk. If, they're, if it's saying it's um, AI generated, there's been numerous examples of things that we know are entirely AI generated, um, uh, sorry, sorry, rather entirely human generated that the tools are flagging up as 100% AI. Um, I, I'm sure there's examples like Harry Potter and the Bible and things like that. Because as I say, someone put Genesis, the book of Genesis through an AI tool, and they all yeah. like Genesis has been AI written, so. <laughs> That's it, there's, there's, there's a novel in it somewhere, but it's not a, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a reality. And, um, 
Yeah. And so, yeah, I wouldn't put a huge amount of weight into those tools. If you know that the quality of the content is good and you know it's human generated, then go ahead and publish that with, with no hesitation. Um, it, it will be fine. Um, I, I strongly suspect that mostly Google doesn't know or care if it is AI generated as long as it is good. Um, and it doesn't have those kind of buzzwords. Yeah, the, the buzzwords my biggest thing because I also think you need to also take it back to your audiences. So I've read a lot. I mean, I've unfortunately read a lot of AI content. You pretty much get a feel for what is and isn't AI, especially when you start saying moreover, furthermore, <laughs> uh, a, a blossoming nascent relationship and things like that. And it's like, <laughs> right, yeah, but whatever. And just making sure that's humanized to that point. Like, I don't think as long as it's accurate and users care either, but they do care when it is choppy changing. I mean, like we go back 12 years when we were doing the best holidays in Spain are usually quite cheap because cheap holidays in Spain because a Spanish holiday can work and you just use the keyword stuff before Pand came along and punched that. So it's just similar to buzzword elements. Cool, you thank you. Um, have you considered that GPT might actually be got? We only have four minutes, 50 <laughs> seconds. I, uh, <laughs> If anybody would like to explore that with Mike afterwards, um, <laughs> the bar is located that way. Um, does anyone have so many questions? Ah, oh, oh. I'm going to let Ruth walk straight. I'm going to stop managing. <laughs> um, my question for the panel is, um, how are you communicating the um, challenges of SGE to your clients? Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty, but since majority of the panelists have an agency background um, in the business, What's your action plan? How do you communicate to your clients about the challenge? So my whole talk yesterday was on better ways of communicating um, this around. One of the things I've started using is just trying to understand who your stakeholders are and not so much, oh, by the way, this thing's coming. It's, it's why they should care about why it's coming and relating back to them. There's a, there's a visual um, I actually stole from NASA, which I use for this because, I mean, I don't understand what part of the internet I found this on, but NASA, how they diagram that represents um, how seriously they treat a meteorite hitting the Earth threat. Um, it's called a Torino scale, and I've just modified that, and now I put like, oh, Google's, I don't know, sneezed, the dot goes here, Google's rolling out SGE, yeah, it's probably somewhere around there, and that just visually helps communicate if it's going to be a page level, domain level, and likelihood. So there's multiple ways to be ultimately stakeholder management and just being able to better relate it because your CFO of your client doesn't care if, I don't know, there's going to be some new fancy, SERP, I mean, Google calls it SERP decoration, there's going to be some new fancy SERP decoration on it. What they care about is how that's going to impact sales bottom line. So that's how you tie it back. So the CMO probably will care about that, but they more care about their other KPIs. So it's that mapping process. I think that is exactly it in the sense that the client cares about the outcome, not how you get there. Most of the time I would like them to because they're re it's a really smart way of getting there, but they're very much uh, in the in the mindset of that, is it gonna hurt my business or is it a good thing for my business? And are you prepped? As long as we can convince them of that and that usually comes with measurement data and testing and also honesty is the best policy. Just tell them of the, you know, what you know. Most of us still don't know if it's, you know, when, the, when it's gonna be impacting uh, the search uh, world, so it's like you know, that 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 is the truth, and just keep them abreast of what's happening. Great to know, thank you. I mean, we've got just over two minutes left. We will be hanging around afterwards as well. Hello, yeah, thank you. So, um, a lot of the talk these days with AI is uh, talking, is just discussing around what AI can't do yet. So you get a lot of arguments to say. Uh, AI can't do this, therefore I still have a job. AI can't do this, therefore I'm going to open up a business and just do whatever the gap is. So I think that m m my question to the panel is, if if you could look into the future for, you know, because you, you all have a great expertise in this, so what are the gaps that you think AI will, f what are the AI gaps that you think will be filled in the, in the near future? Therefore, what would be the skill set that you would recommend we spend more time on as marketeers? Uh, in order to ca still continue bringing value to our businesses or our, our clients? I'll take that one. I am passionate about that one. <laughs> um, I would, my recommendation to our colleagues, clients, or who, anybody who asks that, you know, what is going to be in the distant future, not the 18 months, but the five years, uh, 
anybody who can confidently can predict that, you know, grab them, lock them up because they are essentially the golden goose. Um, but more importantly, based on our understanding of how things are developing, um, I would say learn to brief better. That's probably the most important thing because that's where most of the time a lot of the complaints that we hear about oh AI can't do this uh it doesn't really understand it doesn't really you know speak like a human being the whole point of AI being able to generate these sort of uh in you know good quality information is when you can actually ask it the right questions and that's going to remain if as long as AI needs to engage with another human being there needs to be a language that it engages with and we would say to all marketeers non-marketeers, anybody who's engaging with AI, learn to brief better. Yeah, per per perfectly answered with 10 seconds left before my roof starts throwing <laughs> things at me. So as we wrap up, I just want to thank Irene, uh, John, Joe, Mike, and yourselves for being here for this recording. We will be hanging around afterwards, I don't know, zero, um, just to kind of answer any questions you may have, but thank you very much for being here listening. <laughs>